morning, church. You were well? You all told me you were well after coming in the door. But it's very true, isn't it? This amazing grace of God that has set us free and has opened our eyes to see that we might become all that God would have us to become in this world and ultimately to stand in his presence and behold his beauty. That's our destiny. Uh, welcome, family. Can we have some lights on? Yeah? Um, before I introduce Dr. Mark Harwood and his lovely wife, Jenny, and uh, we're grateful for their team that's feverishly been preparing for us out in the cafe there. Uh, so welcome, guys, in the cafe. And have the children gone? Okay. There are a few seats that have been come available to you guys sitting out in the cafe if anybody wants to move in and join us. Got a bit of business to do, visitors. I'm sorry, welcome visitors. A bit of business to do. Um, I have an announcement to make. Um, Olivia and Isaac have welcome. I'm sorry, Isaac, Olivia. Oh, Olivia's not here. Where are you, Isaac? I'm sorry, Isaac, I had to write it down. Um, this is why she stayed home. They welcomed Evelyn. Evelyn? Yeah. We've got that much right. They welcomed Evelyn into the world on what night? What morning? Two days ago. Two days ago. <laughs> His life's blur. Yeah. So in the room right now, there's a new dad, there are new grandparents. Woo! Uh, Woo! And our family grew a little more. Um, and there's one other thing uh, we need to do, and that is Esther. Way down the back there. We, we love Esther and we're sad. Um, I find it difficult to talk to people when they first say this to me, but I've got over it. Esther's leaving us. She's moving to Perth. The um, Lord's calling her there. It's such a blessing. Yeah. I mean, and that cat? That hat? Oh, my. Hats it all off. Yeah. So we want to pray, um, visitors, if you could join us as well. We want to pray for Esther as she makes. She's been such a blessing to this fellowship. She's such a blessing to the kids and children's church. And I know that where the Lord takes her, the blessing is just going to continue, right? Yeah. So I'm going to invite Russ and Jim. If they would come and uh, lead us all in prayer. And oh, Father God, we just come to your precious throne of grace. Father, we just thank you so much that you blessed us with Esther. Father, with heavy heart, Father, that we feel we'll let her go. You called her, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, you have such a purpose for this lady, Father. We just thank you that she listens to your voice and is led by your spirit. And Father, we thank you for the blessing she's been to us. And Father, when you finish with her in Perth, bring her back to us. <laughs> Father, we just thank you so much for her heart, Father, to, to show your love, your love, your forgiveness, your mercy, your abundance. We just thank you, Lord, that you have given her to us for this time, Father. You bless this child. So, Father, with heavy hearts, we say, Lord, you take her and do what you have to do because we know you want to bless her. You want to fill her life with you and your purposes. Father, we just thank you that she's here with us at the moment. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, we are just a short chat with Mark. Um, I mean, two or three minutes, just down in the end of the hallway there, made me realize that you are in for a treat this morning. You are in for a treat this morning. Yeah. So I invite Dr. Mark Harwood 
and um, if Jenny can be happy for a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll come over here. <laughs> Thank you. And after the after the service, um, there's lots of information out there. Um, and these guys will be available, and and Mark's team will be available to continue to, to bless you and minister to us. It's a very, very important message for a, for a very opportune time in human history. Isn't that right? Mm. Yeah. Amen. So I'll let Absolutely. You Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Jim, we won't need the lectern. No. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Chris, and good morning, everyone. It, uh, it is such a privilege to be able to be with you this morning and to speak on this very important subject about origins. Um, now, it turns out we can only use this centre screen and not the side one, so I'm going to keep on moving so I don't block too much of it. But that's just my excuse, really, because I like to move anyway. <laughs> You know, it is such an important topic. I had the great privilege of speaking at uh, the ministry school of a large church in Sydney a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, and uh, I had two Tuesday evenings to talk about Genesis. And uh, after the first evening, I, I usually set homework for the students to do, and this couple came to me, let's call them Bill and Sally, and they said, look, all this stuff you're talking about in Genesis is, uh, is just information. Um, people need to have an encounter with Jesus. And of course, they're absolutely right, because without an encounter with Jesus, nothing changes, does it? But nonetheless, I was a little bit disappointed that I somehow hadn't got through to them the connection between the opening chapters of Genesis and the gospel message. Well, this couple, Bill and Sally, were teaching scripture at the local state high school in Sydney, where Jenny and I live. And uh, the next week, they came in early to the class and said, with beaming faces, guess what happened to us? When they began the lesson, it was the last week of term and they're about to go into the vacation period. So they said to the students, put your hand up if you would like us to pray for you that you have an encounter with Jesus. Nobody moved. And then a hand went up at the back and a young lady asked, I, I don't get it. What's all this stuff about Adam and Eve, the first man and woman? Was that real? Now, Sally, who had done her homework, said, oh, I can answer that. And so she explained about Adam and Eve. And then another hand went up, and this young man this time said, well, what about the story of a guy and lots of animals on a big boat? Was that true? Oh, I can answer that, said Sally, and proceeded to explain. Every single question for the whole of that lesson period was all about the first 11 chapters of the Bible. At the end of the session, as the period due to a close, they said, now look, it's holiday time coming up. Put your hand up if you would like us to pray for you that you have an encounter with Jesus. Friends, do you know that every single hand in that class went up except for one? So what had happened? I think what had happened was those young people came to understand that the Bible was about real things, actual history, things that had actually taken place. Christianity is not just some religious philosophy like a whole bunch of other ones. It was real and true. So they wanted, therefore, an encounter with Jesus. Now, I should say at the very outset that I happen to believe that this book, the Bible, is God's word and it is the truth. So is anybody with me on that today? <laughs> One or two of you, that's good. <laughs> So the first thing I want to do today is to introduce you to, um, to Pixie, the pixelated elephant, because I want to talk on this subject, uh, elephants in the room. Now, has anyone heard the expression, there's an elephant in the room? Yeah, it's an old-fashioned expression. Some of the younger people may not. And what it means is that there's some issue or some topic that everybody knows about, but no one wants to mention. It's like having an elephant in the room and you're having a conversation, but nobody mentions it but we all know it's there. 
So I want to talk about some different elephants in rooms today. You know, in our culture, we are taught that we came about purely by chance, that um, everything just happened over millions and millions of years through random, unguided processes. And I'm going to try and make this bit here work, but it's ignoring me faithfully. You love technology, you know, sometimes it goes and often it doesn't. That's good. So when we look at the world, we have what's called a world view. And uh, our worldview is something that we are not usually taught, but you kind of catch it, you know. It's what your family believes, your community believes, what society in general believes. And in our culture today, we believe this story about how we all came to be over billions and billions of years of random, unguided processes, what you might call evolution. So when we look at the world around us, we think in terms of vast periods of time, billions and billions of years, random processes. Death has always been present whenever there's been life. Molecules transformed themselves into mankind, dinosaurs into birds, and so on. But my invitation to you today is to change the glasses with which you look at the world to taking God's word as the authority. Now, when we do that, we see exactly the same world and the same evidence, but with a different perspective. Now we see a created universe that we live in that's not very old, just thousands of years old. There was no death before the fall, that there are created kinds, that one kind of that creature doesn't change into another kind, um, that uh, dinosaurs actually lived with humans, there was once a global catastrophic flood, and so on. So we look at exactly the same evidence, but we have a completely different way of looking at it, a different world view. So why do worldviews matter? Well, let me use the analogy of, of two trees. You see, the roots of the tree are like our beliefs, and the fruit that the trees produce are the results of that worldview. So on the left-hand side here, we have the... The, uh, the soil that says there is no God, so the roots go down into that. On the other side, there is a God. Now, if there is no God, then man decides truth because there's no one else in this universe that um, is uh, above us or higher than us or is in authority over us. But if there is a God, then God's word will determine truth. Now, if man determines truth and there is no God... The only choice we have is to explain the universe in purely natural terms, this evolutionary story, if you will. But if God's word is truth, then it tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. So what kind of fruit do these two trees produce? Well, if we are the result of random processes over millions and millions of years, then fundamentally there's no purpose to our lives. We're merely cosmic accidents. But if we are the creation of the living God, he's made us for a purpose. He's given us gifts, abilities, and so on. And so we have a destiny to look forward to, to live out while we are here on this earth. If there is no God, then life is really expendable. Uh, you know, we just, uh, we just leave and then we die and that's it. So what do we find in a culture that believes there's no God? Well... You know, we can get rid of babies if we don't want them, so we have abortion. Old people become a bit of a burden on society, get rid of them, so you have euthanasia. Life has no inherent value. But if we are created in the image of God, then life is sacred. What different fruit is produced? Also, different races or groups of human beings have apparently evolved at different rates and so some are more evolved than others and Darwin told us that dark-skinned people were just one step removed from the apes and uh, so it actually breeds racism. Now we're told uh, things like the Black Lives Matter movement say oh it's slavery that feeds racism but you know it's not true it's actually belief in evolution that feeds racism but if we're created in the image of God we're all part of the one human family Adam and Eve are our original parents, and we are all related if we go back far enough. 
And finally, what we see happening in our culture today is all this gender ideology. We can choose what gender we are, apparently, at will, and uh, as frequently as we choose. But the Bible tells us that God made us male and female from the very beginning. Part of our identity is how he made us at the moment of conception. So these two trees produce radically different fruit. And friends, over on the left-hand side is what our community is like today because the roots have gone down deep into the belief that there's no God. And we use the evolutionary story to justify that belief. So what happens in the culture is like these two castles. Here we have the uh, castle of secular humanism, our culture. It's based on evolution, man's deciding truth. And we have all of the social issues that we face in our world today. On the right-hand side, we have the church, the Christian message based on God's word that there is a creator God. Now, people in the church, unfortunately, some of them, are busy here trying to destroy our own foundations. Um, some are rightly trying to address the social issues of today. Some Christians are actually lining up to take pot shots at other Christians. Some Christians just fire randomly off into space. And some Christians have got absolutely no idea that there's even a battle going on. And I think that kind of sums up what our Western culture is like, doesn't it? So what's the solution? I think the solution is that as a church, we need to return to the authority of the word of God and particularly what it says in those opening chapters in the book of Genesis. So we need to start to rebuild the foundations. We also need to point out to our culture that the foundational belief, evolution, is actually flawed. And I'm going to share some of that in a little while. So we should be attacking the foundations. We should, of course, continue to address the social issues of the day. But when we do this, I believe the church will have far more impact in our society today. Because we need to go back to the authority of the word of God and not try and add into our thinking the evolutionary worldview. Now, I want to share a, uh, a quote from you, uh, with you from Dan Brown. Now, you probably know of Dan Brown. He wrote The Da Vinci Code. There was a movie about it. Anybody see the movie? It was all, you know, fast-paced, very, you know, great detective kind of stuff. Dan Brown was a young, as a young man, was very religious. He said, I was raised Episcopalian and I was very religious as a kid. Then in eighth or ninth grade, I studied astronomy, cosmology and the origins of the universe. I remember saying to a minister, I don't get it. I read a book that says there was an explosion known as the Big Bang, but here it says God created heaven and earth in seven days, which is right. Now, friends, how would you answer Dan Brown? Are you prepared and able to answer Dan Brown? Well, how did the minister answer? And I hope this is not what you would say. The minister said, nice boys, don't ask that question. A light went off and I said, the Bible doesn't make sense. Science makes much more sense to me. And I just gravitated away from religion. What a tragedy. A young boy, eighth or ninth grade, probably in his sort of teens, middle teens perhaps, all he needed was an answer to his question. And he didn't get the answer. What a shame. The Bible says that we are to always be prepared, doesn't it? To give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And that's what the Ministry of Creation Ministries is actually all about. So Charles Darwin put forward this idea that all of life could be traced back to some original primordial cell and over millions and millions of years of random, unguided processes, we end up with all these different creatures and at the top of the pile, we have mankind. He called it the tree of life. But it actually requires death to be the engine of creativity. So I think a better definition is to say it's really a tree of death. But anyway, that's just a side. But Darwin's whole idea, this idea of this gradual continuum and a slow process, actually rested on the beliefs and the views of a guy called Charles Lyell. Now, Lyell produced some books on geology in the middle 1800s, a copy of which Charles Darwin took with him on his voyage on the Beagle. On the Beagle. And in a letter to some friends, Lyell wrote, 
that his objective was to free science from Moses. What does he mean by that? Moses, of course, wrote the first five books of the Bible, didn't he? Including the book of Genesis and the description of the flood and so on. So his objective was quite clearly to free people from believing what the Bible says. Now these views, the opinions of Darwin and Charles Lyell, are actually philosophies, ways of looking at the evidence. So what actually is science? And I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about this. I had the great privilege of working in the aerospace industry. I was involved in the design of all of Australia's national satellites. Now, I'm sure you've seen those little dishes on rooftops pointing up at the heavens. You know the things I mean? You get Ostar, um, Foxtel, ABC, SBS, the commercial TV networks, all the pay TV programs. You do need to understand, though, that I have nothing to do with the content that comes over the satellites, all right? I hope you appreciate that. Now, Optus owns and operates Australia's national satellite system. And uh, I know a lot of you here today will have Telstra phones, and I'm happy to pray with you after the meeting. But now, anyway, <laughs> so the kind of science that I was involved in is what you could call experimental science. Now, that's the kind of science which gives us all the amazing technological gadgets that we just take for granted, like mobile phones, computers, and all this amazing stuff. Importantly, though, experimental science is based on observable, repeatable experiments. So a scientist in one country can conduct an experiment, a scientist in another country can repeat that experiment, verify the results, and that's how our understanding of how the universe works increases and improves, and we can use that knowledge to make amazing inventions. But there's another kind of science that we hear a lot about. You could call it historical science. Now, in historical science, the science looks at evidence in the present and then he makes up a story about the past to explain what he's observing in the present. So this guy here, he's looking at this fossil in the rock. Now, if he happens to believe the evolutionary story, if that's his worldview, then I can imagine him looking at that little fossil and thinking, I wonder where it fits in that long, slow progression from the first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me. I can imagine him thinking, how many millions of years ago did it live? So can you see that what he already believes about its origins affects how he interprets the evidence? Does that make sense? But what if this guy was a Bible-believing Christian? He might look at that little fossil in the rock and think to himself, you know, this fossil was probably laid down as a result of Noah's flood which would have deposited the whole of the fossil record pretty much around the world today. Now, friends, that's a radically different interpretation of the same data. So we don't argue about the data so much as how you interpret the data. And our interpretation depends on where the roots of our belief have been put down. So let's summarise that. Experimental science is about the present, observable, repeatable experiments. You know, friends, in the area of experimental science, there is never a disagreement between scriptures and science. Never. But in historical science, which is about the unobservable, unrepeatable past, that's where all the conflict takes place. And not surprisingly, because the evolutionary view starts with the assumption there is no God and we explain everything naturally, whereas from a biblical point of view, we know there is a God who created the heavens and the earth and we start with the historical record in the Bible to explain the universe around us. You see, science studies repeatable things, but it's history that studies unrepeatable things. And our origins, by definition, are unrepeatable. So how do we find the truth about our origins? Because we can't go back into the past to find out what happened, can we? We can't observe it. All we've got is the present. So what we need is an eyewitness account from someone who is there, who loves us, who would not deceive us, and who has written down everything we need to know about our origins. And friends, we have exactly that in this book, the Bible. You see, the Bible is like a history book of the universe. Of course, it's more than that. It tells us how we can be in relationship with our Heavenly Father. But it is at least a history book. 
So when the Bible contains passages of history, we can have complete confidence that they are true. And when we open this Bible up, we discover it tells us that God created everything in just six normal length days, just like the days we experience now. It tells us that man rebelled against God and brought death and suffering and misery into the world. God didn't make the world a mess. We messed it up. Made in God's image, we rebelled against him. God's character is only ever, always good. And it also tells us that God judged the world with a global catastrophic flood. But there's a problem, isn't there? Because in this biblical room, there's an elephant, a huge elephant, with all this stuff on it, natural selection, change over time, mutations, the millions of years. Isn't all that stuff proven? It's in all the university textbooks, high school textbooks, TV documentaries tell you all about it. So what do we do with the elephant that's in the room? Well, there are a number of different strategies, and over the years, various people have tried all of these. One is to ignore the elephant. We just pretend it's not there. We won't talk about it. We'll focus all our teaching and everything, all about everything else about the Christian life. We'll just, just ignore the elephant in the room. Well, I don't think that's a good idea, and let me share some examples of why. This man, Charles Templeton, was a running mate of Billy Graham's. He was a Canadian evangelist. In fact, it was said that he was a better evangelist than Billy Graham. And this photograph is of a mass rally with Charles Templeton preaching. So Charles Templeton decided to uh, improve his knowledge of the faith. So he went off to a theological cemetery, uh, a seminary, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there... Actually, it was Princeton, if you really want to know. And he learnt about um, liberal theology. And uh, really what liberal theology is, is an attempt to fit evolution into the Bible. That's, that's what started it back in the late 1800s. And he ended up writing a book called Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. And in that book he said, I believe there's no supreme being with human attributes, no God in the biblical sense, but that all life is the result of timeless evolutionary forces having reached its present transient state over millions of years. What a tragedy. He added in belief in evolution. You know, his story is not uh, by any means the only one. This man uh, wrote and said, I went to Bible college thinking Adam and Eve are real people. I can remember really wrestling with that when my Old Testament professor was pointing out the obvious myths and how they came to be. And I kind of joked at the time that I prayed my way all the way to atheism. A young man goes to Bible college, feels the call of God in his life to become a pastor, and loses his faith at Bible college. But you know, friends, Tragically, most of the Bible colleges in our country today teach various compromised positions, and I'll touch on them in just a minute. A very well-known atheist and evolutionist summed this up very well. He said, belief in modern evolution makes atheists of people. One can have a religious view that is compatible with evolution only if the religious view is indistinguishable from atheism. Isn't that interesting? Very sobering, I think. Well, the elephant is still there. So ignoring the elephant is not a good strategy. So then some theologians thought, well, maybe, given that the scientists have proven this stuff about evolution, somehow we've got to fit it into the Bible. And they got some very, very clever approaches to doing just that. And there's a whole bunch of these. Every single one of these that's up on the screen is taught somewhere at a Bible college in this country. And uh, one that I often hear as I travel around is, well, maybe God's days were not the same as man's days. You know, God's outside of time. Perhaps it was just a figure of speech. So you could reasonably ask the question, does the Bible really mean six days? Now, the word for day in the Hebrew is this word yom, and it's true, it can have multiple meanings. In fact, it's true in any language. I've concocted this rather contrived little sentence. In my father's day. Now, that means an indefinite period of time in the past. 
clearly doesn't mean that my father lived for 24 hours because otherwise I wouldn't be here. It took 10 days. Do you know if you put a number next to the word day, it always means a 24-hour day. Now, I think today's the 26th of March. Is that right? Did I get that right? Good. I often don't know what day it is. It's amazing. <laughs> so if I said to you, I was going to return to this church uh, in three days' time, you'd think I was coming back on the 29th. You immediately assume if it's got a number, it's a 24-hour day. And we could say to drive across the outback during the day. That means the daylight hours of the day. But friends, the context always makes it clear. And God doesn't leave us in any doubt as to whether he meant six days or not. Because in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, in the giving of the Ten Commandments, commandment number four is about keeping the seventh day as a day of rest. And this was the finger of God writing on the tablets of stone. There's no human intermediary here. And God says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. They must have been real days, right? He didn't mean you've got to work for six million years and then rest for a million years. right? He meant days. The days are days. And then people say, oh, well, maybe, maybe Genesis is all poetry, you know, and it's uh, just a, a poetic expression and we don't take it seriously. It's not meant to be interpreted as actual reality. Well, you know, there is actually only one verse of poetry in Genesis chapter 1, and it's Genesis 1.27. How do I know it's poetry? I mean, we can't use devices like rhyming or meter because it's a completely different language, which is actually uh, in, uh, is not actually spoken in the form it was in uh, Genesis today. But we can pick Hebrew poetry with some telltale signs, one of which is a thing called a chiasmus. It's a structure. Can you see it says A, then B, then B, then A. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. This is poetic. It's like when God describes the creation of man in his own image, he breaks into poetry to express the pinnacle of his creative effort. That's the only verse of poetry in Genesis 1. The rest is prose. Magnificent prose, yes, but prose nonetheless. And then others think, well, maybe God used evolution to create. He was sort of like behind the scenes, pressing the buttons, pulling the levers, making sure things evolved as they should. But how does that work with God's declaration that everything that he had made was very good? Because if Adam and Eve came about through millions of years of evolution, then when they were in the Garden of Eden, under their feet were layers and layers of rock with fossils showing death, disease and suffering for millions of years. Friends, how could that be very good? I mean, can you imagine... Adam surrounded by the death of animals all around because some people think, well, maybe, maybe animals died, but it was just Adam that didn't. I mean, I can imagine it might have been a scene like that. I mean, how bizarre. How can God declare such a horrible situation as very good? And then others say, well, maybe, maybe it was just spiritual death. Maybe, maybe Adam was going to die physically anyway. But remember, when God spoke to him during the curse, God said, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Why would God say that if Adam was going to die anyway? Adam would have just said, eh, so what? I'm going to die anyway. You see, Adam's rebellion brought physical death into the world. It was not there before. And it also brought separation from God. So friends, all of these Compromised positions, as I call them, all have one fatal flaw, and that is that every single one of them places death before Adam's sin. So if that's true, why did Jesus die for us on the cross? You see, if this is true, if there was death before Adam, Jesus died because of how God created the world. But that's not what my Bible says. It says that Jesus died to pay the price for my and your sin. And what was the price? It was death, wasn't it? Guess what? The elephant is still there. So you can't ignore it. You can't try and integrate it into the Bible because it doesn't go. 
I think the best strategy is to walk over to this elephant and actually give it a good poke. How real is it? Let's just look at this whole question of natural selection, for instance. We're told in our high school biology classes these days that natural selection and evolution are the same thing. You'll see it on TV documentaries and so on. And that's how simple organisms became complex over millions and millions of years. But how does natural selection actually work? Now, if you want to make something complicated, you need plans, you need information. We know, for instance, that this building didn't come about because of an explosion in a brick pit, right? <laughs> Somebody designed it, and all the raw materials were delivered on site, and the builders built it, right? There must have been instructions. But the same is true of living organisms, because information is needed to specify living organisms. Like, for instance, a single-celled bacterium. You could take all the assembly instructions, write them down in a book. It would be a large book, maybe a, like a 500-page uh, encyclopedia volume or something. But if you wanted to make a more complex animal, like, say, a horse, you need a lot more information. Now you need information about making heart, lungs, eyes, muscles, and all the rest of it. Books full of added information to go onto the DNA. And all of that information is stored in this incredible molecule. You know, in human DNA, there are some three billion separate letters. That is um, uh, just you know, a formidable amount of information. In fact, human, the instructions on human DNA would fill a thousand large books. So how does all that added information get written through natural processes? So Darwin thought it was through natural selection. But let's have a look at how natural selection works. Now, you need to use your imaginations here because, um, yeah, so the first step in the imagination is these two little dogs, right? And they have medium-length hair. Now, let's imagine they have medium-length hair because they have a short-haired gene and a long-haired gene. Let's assume it's only due to two genes. It's more complex than that, but that'll serve the argument. And these are co-dominant, so these two little dogs have medium-length hair. Now, if you take those two little dogs, you can get a collection of puppies from them. This first little guy, he gets the short-haired gene from each of his parents, so he has very short hair. This next two here, they're like their parents. They get a long-haired gene and a short-haired gene, so they have medium-length hair. But this little guy, he gets the jackpot. <laughs> so he gets the long-haired gene from each of his parents, so he's a very hairy little dog. Now let's ima imagine that that population of dogs migrates into a cold country with lots of ice and snow and sleet. The short-haired dogs and the medium-length-haired dogs will be selected against by the environment because they're not well suited. They'll die out. And before long, all you will have are very hairy little dogs. Now, if those two should fall in love and have a bunch of puppies, guess what? They will all be hairy dogs. But can you see what has happened? the information for making short and medium-length-haired dogs has gone. It's been taken out of the gene pool. So natural selection reduces information. At the very best, you can just rearrange what is already there, but it does not increase it. So evolution has to go from less information to more information to go from simple to complex. But natural selection goes downhill. It's the wrong way. So natural selection is an observable phenomenon and it's not a problem on the elephant in the biblical room. So what about this change over time? We often hear it said that you can see evolution happening and the professor says, I see it happening in my lab. Now what he's thinking about is uh, he might take fruit fly and he might see all kinds of different combinations of wings and mutations and what have you, but the way it's presented to the public mind is that it proves a sort of amoeba to mathematician kind of story, this, uh, this progression from simple to complex. Well, it's true that things change. I mean, dogs change, but what do they change into? Different dogs, right? And they all greet each other in that doggy sort of way. And uh, take vegetation, plants, for instance, you have this mango tree and produces beautiful mangoes. If you take the seed and plant it, what kind of tree do you get? Another mango tree. Kinds don't change from one to another. Things reproduce according to their kind. 
and we see much variation within the different kinds, but absolutely no evidence observable in the world around us of one kind changing into another. But friends, that is what evolution requires. So in fact, evolution is not change in living things at all. That's a logical inconsistency. It's called equivocation, where you actually change the definition of the word partway through the discussion. But the idea of things running down through natural selection or being constrained to different kinds is all consistent with the Bible. So change over time is not a problem on the elephant in the biblical room. What about mutations? You see, the current story about biology, biological evolution, is that mutations, which are abrupt changes, copying mistakes, if you will, in our DNA, might produce some beneficial trait in an organism, which might mean it produces more and more offspring, and so therefore, maybe that's how we go from simple to complex. And that, by the way, is what's taught in our biology classes today. So can mutations add information? Well, Professor Carl Sagan, a very well-known Atheist and evolutionist, he's dead now, I think he's a creationist. But anyway, he wrote, mutations occur at random and are almost uniformly harmful. It is rare that a precision machine is improved by a random change in the instructions for making it. Now, we all know that intuitively is obvious, isn't it? If you made random changes to the instructions for assembling a spacecraft, you wouldn't get a better product out the factory door, would you? It makes no sense. So mutations are actually copying mistakes. I could take a simple sentence like this one and copy it down and make a few errors. Have I actually added information? Well, no, I've actually deleted information. I've corrupted it. So copying mistakes almost always um, delete information or corrupt it. And certainly random copying errors cannot account for the encyclopedic <coughs> quantities of information in our DNA. Here's an example of a mutation. This little guy is uh, uh, a rooster where the instructions for making feathers has been switched off. Now, if you're the chook farmer, you'll think this is brilliant. Now I don't have to pluck the chooks, right? If you're the little chook, you probably would think differently. You're going to get sunburnt in summer and cold in winter. But So what's happened here is the instructions for making feathers have been turned off through a mutation. But friends, that's not a gain of information. That's a loss of information that has brought about that change. By the way, it has a, a technical name here. It's called the TNR mutant, uh, which stands for Totally Naked Rooster. <laughs> it actually does, I kid you not. But mutations are almost always harmful, aren't they? Have this deformed strawberry, double-headed snake, useless legs on the back of a calf. But mutations can be beneficial, so don't be confused about this. A little beetle on a windy island that has a mutation which means that it can't fly or it has no wings, that's going to survive better than one that can fly, which will get blown off the island and drowned. On the mainland, its cousins all fly. But that's a mutation which is beneficial, but once again, it's a loss of information. Now, Professor Richard Dawkins, who is perhaps the world's most famous um, advocate for evolution and anti-Christian, he was asked this question once, and you can find this uh, in full on the video from a frog to a prince from our website, which I'll tell you about a little later. And the question was this, Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Now, this is fundamental to the evolutionary story, so you would think that the world's champion of evolution would have any number of examples that he could quote in response. So it's very interesting to see how Professor Dawkins handles this question. Oops, we're not getting sound. Genetic mutations or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Friends, I think that silence is very, very eloquent. In fact, if you look at the video, it's, uh, it was actually worse than that. It goes a bit longer. Then he asked the cameras to be switched off and uh, thought for a little while. Then he came back on and answered a question other than the one which was asked. And you can find that 
on uh, from a frog to a prince. So Richard Dawkins was asked uh, on a uh, in an interview once, uh, has evolution been observed? And his response was, evolution has been observed. It's just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. An Australian scientist, Professor Paul Davies, summed it up like this, there is no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. You see, you have to have a mind to create information. And right at the beginning, as God created all the different kinds of animals, he built into the genetic code so much um, variety and potential for change and adaptation that creatures would be able to live in a fallen world. So, friends, mutations are not actually a problem on the elephant in the biblical room. But what about the millions of years? I mean, surely the age of the earth is, you know, that must be a done deal. There's so much evidence for it. We look around the world and we see structures like Grand Canyon and the usual story in geology is that each of those layers was laid down by some kind of a flood or a disaster and then years later, another layer was laid down, and then another one, and so on. And slowly, all those layers were built up over millions and millions of years. And then, in the case of the Grand Canyon, along came the Colorado River, and it slowly eroded out this vast canyon. Obviously, must have taken millions of years. But did it? Let's have a close look. Here's a couple of layers, the Coconino Sandstone on the top, and what's called the Hermit Formation underneath. But you'll notice there's a very sharply defined boundary between the two. Now, traditional geology says that there must be about 10 million years between the Hermit Formation and the Coconino Sandstone. OK, let's think about that. That means the Hermit Shale lay there with a dead flat top for 10 million years. But wouldn't you expect to find some evidence of elapsed time, like vegetation, tree roots, animal burrows, and certainly the next time it rained, you would see signs of erosion. Creeks, rivers, valleys, whatever. Friends, for the hundreds of kilometres that that contact is exposed in Grand Canyon, there is absolutely no evidence of erosion anywhere. In fact, what it really tells us is that those layers were laid down rapidly, one after the other, with very little, if any, elapsed time between them. And we find things like polystrate fossils, where Tree trunks run through multiple strata that presumably were laid down thousands of years apart. But if that was true, the tree trunk would have rotted away long since. And then we find spectacular examples of sedimentary rocks that are bent and folded in the most amazing ways. Has anyone here ever tried to bend a rock? <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? It just shatters. But friends, there is no sign of shattering on these tight bends. So all of those layers, are, which are sedimentary, were laid down by water all at once. And the Bible says that the subsidence of the flood, the mountains rose up, the valleys sank down, all that crustal movement that would have ensued, bent and twisted and buckled those layers, still laden with water, soft and plastic. And that is how we get those kinds of shapes. So the usual evidence that people interpret as meaning that the Earth must be millions of years old can all be interpreted in the light of the effects of the flood of Noah. And the Bible gives us a very accurate timeline. Now, there are things called chronogenealogies at the beginning that take us from Adam through Noah and all the way to the time of Abraham. And we can find out that Abraham was born about 2,000 years after the creation. The time between... Abraham and Jesus is also about 2,000 years. And of course, from the time of Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. So that means, according to the Bible, not my idea, here we are today about 6,000 years after the creation. 6,000 years. Wow, how can anyone believe such a thing in this day and age? But if that was true, and I believe it is, then we would find evidence, wouldn't we? Heaps of it. And there is heaps of it. You don't find it, though, in our secular biology textbooks, geology textbooks, and so on. We're told about the millions of years. Let me share just a few with you very quickly. The river systems around the world dump a certain amount of mud and sediment onto the ocean floor every year. Knowing the rate at which it's increasing and how much is there, we can estimate how long it would have taken for all that sediment to have ended up on the ocean floor. 
you know it would have all got there in less than 12 million years. Now that's a disaster for the evolutionary story because evolution tells us that the oceans are at least 3,000 million years old, not just 12. But you might be thinking, oh, hang on Mark, you just told me that the Earth's about 6,000 years old according to the Bible, that says 12 million. So can anybody think of some mechanism in the past which might have dumped billions of mud, tons of mud and sediment onto the ocean floor? Anyone? No, it's flood. The flood, exactly. I'm glad you got that, otherwise I have to start again. No, no, I'm just kidding. You know, the air we breathe has lots of different gases in it. One of them is helium. That's the gas people put in party balloons, and if you get a mouthful, it makes your voice sound funny. Anybody done that? Yeah. Now, helium is constantly being added to the Earth's atmosphere by radioactive decay processes in the Earth's crust. Some of it actually manages to escape, but once again, there's a net rate at which it is accumulating. So measuring how much is there, the rate at which it's building up, we can place an upper limit on the age of the atmosphere. And we've all got there in two million years. Once again, disastrous result for the evolutionary story. If we look around us today, we discover there are about 8 billion people on the face of this planet. Do you know if you start with six people, Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons and their wives, and let the population grow at a rate of about half a percent for four and a half thousand years, do you know what you get? About 8 billion people. So the population of the world today is consistent with the Bible's record of history. But if we'd been here for 100,000 years, as some people think, or even longer, where are all the people? See, we should be shoulder to shoulder on every square metre of the planet's surface, including the ocean basins, and that wouldn't be enough. It's not like that. All the evidence points to a recent creation. So, friends, the millions of years are not a problem on the elephant in the biblical room because it's not supported by evidence. Amazing. You know what? There is no elephant in the biblical room. But there's an enormous elephant in the Darwinian room. Not the least of which there's been nowhere near enough time for evolution to take place. And every proposed mechanism for going from simple to complex leads to a loss of information, not a gain. And what about how the first living cell came to be. Because the evolutionist has to believe that inanimate chemicals somehow magically combined themselves together to form a reproducing cell. Michael Denton, who was not a Christian when he wrote these words, describing the cell, said, to grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometres in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. We would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. Amazing. Now, Darwin had absolutely no idea what a cell was like. He thought it was just a sort of jelly-like blob but it's full of amazing machinery. And I want to share with you uh, an, a, a little video clip that looks at a postal service that operates in every cell in your body. And this little machine delivers proteins from one part of the cell to another, and it does it all under computer control. <coughs> Inside a living cell is an amazing transportation system. Proteins have to be delivered to the correct part of the cell to perform their intended functions. This animation, based on a lot of clever research over a number of years, shows how it happens. Highways melted microtubules are assembled by interlocking proteins, each manufactured in accordance with the coded instructions on the cell's DNA. Marching along a microtubule is the Kinesin motor. The hero of our story, carrying a huge sack of proteins to be delivered to a predetermined place in the cell. Here, the proteins will be released to fulfill their functions. A cohesive linear motor uses one ATP to provide the energy for each step, 
and takes 135,000 steps to cover one millimeter. This amazing machine shows all the hallmarks of design. Now, I'm not too sure about the little dance he did at the end, <laughs> but what an amazing little guy. There he is carrying this sack of proteins, each one of which has an address label attached to it. Incredible, intricate design. You know, without thousands of those in every one of your cells, you wouldn't be alive. And what about how all this came together by accident? Professor Paul Davies again is very honest. He's not a Christian. He says, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organise themselves into the first living cell. And he asks a very important question. How did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? Now, Sir Fred Hoyle, who is uh, a, a, a non-Christian scientist, but once again also a very astute scientist, uh, says this, the probability of the formation of just one of the many proteins on which life depends is comparable to that of the solar system. Now think about this, the entire solar system packed full of blind people randomly shuffling Rubik's cubes and all arriving at the solution at the same time. Think about that. Imagine what that would look like. <laughs> you see, it's actually impossible for lifeless chemicals to assemble themselves into that first cell. And yet, the evolutionist must believe it. Because he must believe it happened naturally and without a supernatural God intervening. Back in the middle 1800s, Louis Pasteur formulated what we now call the law of biogenesis, that life only originates from life. And that's what we observe, isn't it? Living things reproduce according to their kinds. Now, this gentleman, George Wald, was a recipient of the Nobel Prize, very intelligent man, and, you know, he, he got it. He says, only, one has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Hallelujah. He got it. But wait. He went on to say, and yet, here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. <laughs> so he's just acknowledged it's totally impossible, but you see, his world view, he's placed the roots of his belief down into the soil of atheism. He's got no choice. No choice at all. I'm reminded of Romans 1, 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Well, the origin of life is a massive problem on the elephant in the Darwinian room. But not only that, what is really happening as we look around us? Do you know that life is fading away? Humanity is dying primarily because of mutations. The very things that our biology courses tell us are ever improving us. But it's not true. Have you noticed, by the way, when you have an x-ray at the dentist, do they all stand around the x-ray machine so they can get mutated and improve? Nope, they all leave the room and they put a great big lead shield over you and they're out of the way. <laughs> Because they know that mutations are harmful. In 1, in 1 Peter we read, All men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. You see, we are relentlessly accumulating mutations in our DNA. We are running downhill, friends. We're getting worse and worse with every passing generation. I used to say to my kids, I'm genetically superior to you. It's the only thing I had over them. <laughs> Dr. John Sanford, a world-famous geneticist, concluded there are at least 100 new mutations per person per generation. Each of us have tens of thousands of bad mutations. Two to three percent of all babies born today have a visible birth defect. Five percent of babies are born with some form of genetic disease. That number's now probably a bit higher as it's about 10 years old, that particular data point. There are over 6,000 human Mendelian diseases. That means genetically inherited. Human geneticists all agree we are degenerating. But they're mute. They can't speak because their roots are embedded in atheism. But the evidence that they are looking at tells them that it doesn't work. They're wrong. 
but their jobs are at stake. So what's the verdict of genetic entropy? It's simply this. Darwinian evolution is falsified. Natural selection cannot even preserve our DNA, let alone improve it. And not only that, the timescales of the Bible are confirmed because mankind would, could, cannot have existed for millions of years because we would all be extinct by now. So, friends, there is a huge problem on the elephant in the Darwinian room. In fact, it's so bad that we can replace all of that and there is no real evidence for evolution. Now, that's a very bold statement to make in this day and age, but I believe it's true. That is evolution in the sense of molecules to mankind through natural processes. So... Oh, I love this one. Richard, Darwin, uh, Richard Dawkins, very committed to Darwin, and he says, we don't need evidence. We know it to be true. <laughs> Friends, that's a world view, isn't it? That's a belief system. That's a very religious, faith-filled statement to make. So Darwin's grand ideas and Lyell's views about the age of the earth actually all fade into insignificance because... The observed data overwhelmingly supports the Genesis account of creation. So here's the problem again. What is it? Our society is built upon the assumption that there's no God, man decides truth, evolution. The solution, the church needs to reinforce its foundations on the authority of the word of God, attack the foundations of our culture, as well as addressing the social issues of the day. So the Bible tells us that we are to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And friends, I want to suggest to you today that belief in evolution, which is the belief of our culture, is the greatest pretension that stops people coming to know God. And I say that because how can you come to know a God that you're not even sure exists? I mean, we got in by accident, didn't we? No, we did not. The Bible tells us plainly, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we can't all be scientists, so you can't demolish all the arguments that way. But that's why our ministry exists. And it's there to equip you with resources. We have a website. This is what the front page of it looks like. The top right-hand corner is a search engine in there that gives you access to over 13,000 different articles and items of interest. There's a new article every day on the front page, and we encourage people to go onto that, read it. It's a faith-building, God-honouring material. Now, the website has a very easy web address to remember. But if you say something at the same time as seeing it, it helps to imprint it into your memory. So I want you to say the web address when it comes up on the screen. So is everyone ready for that? Okay, so... Are you ready? Yes, good. So if you want to know about creation, you just go to... Very good. We also have a free email newsletter service that we send out once every one or two weeks. Gives you a, we don't spam your inbox with it. It gives you a summary of some of the key articles that have come up on the website. Um, and uh, if you give us your postcode, then we can let you know about events that are happening in your area. The very first one you get will give you access to a free video download. And uh, there's a form out there on the tables and our volunteers will guide you towards that. We just need your email address, um, your name, and if you put your postcode there, then we can let you know if things are happening in the area. We also have Creation Magazine, which is probably uh, our flagship publication. This is written for lay people. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it short, very attractive articles that just point to the creator, God, and the truth of the scriptures. There's also a children's section inside, and, uh, and the kids really love it. We had the privilege of raising our children on a good, solid diet of Creation magazine. All of them went on to be with the Lord. Now, well, to walk with the Lord. <laughs> Freudian slip there. You know, it's a fabulous resource because it answers your own questions. It equips you to answer the questions of others, and it's a wonderful witnessing tool. You can subscribe for one or three years, and with every subscription today, you'll get a free back issue of the magazine. 
so that you'll have something to take away and read and then hopefully to give away. Um, if you give us your email address, by the way, you can get a digital version of it. So grandparents, that's a great way of sharing the magazine with your grandchildren. Fantastic resource. I love this testimony. This guy wrote to us and said, I was converted when someone gave me a creation magazine. Then I subscribed. Isn't that, isn't that great? He came into the kingdom because some, someone just gave him one. But I love what he did next. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. How amazing is that? So there's a form like this out the back. We recommend you get a hold of it. Perhaps I should ask who here already subscribes to Creation Magazine? Anyone? Yep, yeah, we have a few. That's great. Well, if you're already a subscriber, I'd recommend you think about giving a gift subscription to somebody, a member of your family or a friend with whom you're sharing your faith, perhaps. Now, if you take a three-year subscription, there's a $15 voucher available, uh, which you can spend on any of the resources out the, in the foyer there today. And uh, a good way to do that is um, to purchase the Creation Answers book. This is what it looks like, a little red book. It consists of 20 short chapters that address the most asked questions that Christians and non-Christians alike have. Things like, how do I know there's a God? Um, what about carbon dating? We can get time to do that today. And uh, the classic question... Where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? It's all there in the answers book. Now, you can also spend your $15 on any of the DVDs that we have out there. Martin Williams has. I'm not sure this particular one is there, but there's one out there called The Gospel Implications of Creation. Fantastic DVD, and there are quite a few others. If you want, <clears throat> if you want a really in-depth, solid commentary on these first 11 chapters, I'd recommend this one, The Genesis Account. It's a theological, historical and scientific commentary which I think is without peer. And this is a new book released only early this year on dinosaurs, Titans of the Earth, Sea and Air, a fantastic book. We have a wide variety of videos, short ones, long ones, all available on the media tab on our website. So friends, let me try and summarise it all like this. The evolutionary story places millions and millions of years of death and struggle and suffering before mankind even appears. That means Adam's rebellion in the garden had no effect. But the Bible says it was Adam's actions in the garden that led to suffering and death coming into the world. This world is a mess, friends, not because God made it that way, because we have rebelled against him. But praise God, he did not leave us in that situation. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So friends, as we share this gospel message with people today, we need to remember, first and foremost, that we're talking about the creator of the universe, who left his home in glory in the greatest act of love that this universe has ever seen. He gave his very life for us, a sinless life, to pay the price for our sin. And the price was death. Why? Because the first Adam brought death into the world. The last Adam set us free. Friends, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now, interceding for each and every one of us. And the Bible says he is the bridegroom waiting at that wedding feast to which we have all been invited so if you're a believer here today and you've not known what to do about this issue of origins, I want to encourage you to get equipped, get hold of the resources, equip yourself so you can confidently share your faith and give the answers to other people. Our culture has its roots in the wrong soil. We need truth. Perhaps you're here and you're not a believer. I would encourage you to take that step of faith. It would be the best decision you ever made. Friends, thank you so much for your attention this morning. It's been such a privilege to share with you. And let me hand back now to Pastor Chris.